This decade didn't start well at all. We're going to begin here with the outbreak of a mystery virus in China that now has the World Health Organization on edge. The mystery virus started here in the city of Wuhan. For the past 30 years, globalization has improved all our lives and has brought economic growth to countries all over the world. A giant container ship wedged from bank to bank, blocking one of the world's most important shipping lanes. We've grown dependent on our supply chains and have taken the low costs and reliability of international shipping for granted. Work disruptions at U.S. ports due to the pandemic and the recent bottleneck at the Suez Canal have caused serious shortages of empty containers that would regularly arrive in China on vessels returning from the United States. It's a standstill at sea. Dozens of cargo ships waiting for weeks off the coast of California. Now, in many countries, we're experiencing a full-blown supply chain crisis and the dependability of the international logistics network is shattered. People have different opinions on the supply chain disruptions, product shortages, and shipping crisis. In this video, we'll try to look at all the facts and paint a bigger picture. The issues in the supply chain have made a lot of people start asking questions. Like, for example, why don't we make things anymore? Why is everything manufactured in China? These are questions that many are asking for good reason, since a lot of ports in the U.S. and around the world are backlogged with ships full of containers packed with Chinese goods. And it would make sense to manufacture things locally rather than outsource everything to China or other Asian countries. Politicians in many countries also really like talking about this subject, especially because it makes them look more popular in front of voters and because this is what people love to hear. I'll be the greatest jobs president that God ever created. I'll take them back from China, from Japan, from Mexico. The future will be made in America. I've long said that I don't accept the defeatist view that the forces of automation and globalization can't keep, can keep, can keep union jobs from growing here in America. We can create more of them, not fewer of them. I don't buy for one second the, uh, that the vitality of the American manufacturing is a thing of the past. Being self-sufficient and not having to rely on other countries for any resources sounds ideal for any country. Unfortunately, history has shown that this isn't possible. We've seen countries that have voluntarily cut themselves off from the rest of the world and tried to be self-sufficient, but in the end, that didn't really work out for them. International trade brings a number of valuable benefits to a country, and it is responsible for much of the development and prosperity of the modern industrialized world. So back to the politicians promising to increase manufacturing and industry in their home countries. The fact of the matter is, politicians do what politicians do. They give speeches and make promises in order to get voters on their side. But as we've seen before, they don't really understand the logistics and what aiming towards those goals actually implies. We're going to build the wall. We have no choice. So we're going to build it. Who's going to pay for the wall? 100 percent. By the way, 100 percent. The reality is that for the products and industries we've outsourced to China in the last 30 or so years, we don't really have a skilled workforce anymore. Most big factories that were once representative in their specific industries have closed off long ago. This was because those factories couldn't stay competitive or cost-effective, either due to losing a big chunk of market share or their companies decided to move production to countries with cheaper labor like China. Most of these factories are now former ruins of themselves or have been demolished and repurposed for something else. The old generation of skilled laborers that once worked in those factories are long after their retirement age, and those skills haven't been passed on to a newer generation. So for politicians to talk about bringing back industries that have been outsourced to China for such a long time, especially in a four or five year term, doesn't seem so realistic. Another reason why a lot of manufacturing has been outsourced by big corporations to China that everyone knows, but many don't want to talk about, is that costs there are cheaper. Even some people that complain about Chinese manufacturing taking away jobs from home, if they had to choose between two products of similar quality, one manufactured locally and one overseas, they would still choose the cheaper product no matter where it's manufactured. And for many people, having a cheaper option or not could mean the difference between being able to afford supper or not if you had to choose between two products of similar quality, one manufactured locally but double the price of one that's imported, which one would you choose? Would you pay double to support your country, or would you go with the cheaper one? Please let us know in the comments below. There are also a lot of voices blaming the companies for being greedy and valuing profits over anything else. 
Sure, some corporations have closed their manufacturing plants in their home countries and made profits off Chinese labor. But as always, there's two sides to a story. In order to stay in business, a company needs to be profitable. As a business, you can't charge whatever price you want unless maybe you're a monopoly. If your competition sells products of the same quality as you at a lower price, it won't be long till you go out of business. However, it's not like Western countries aren't manufacturing anything anymore. The industries and jobs that have moved to China in the past 30 or so years are for consumer products that require intensive manual labor. Which brings us to labor shortages. Or better said, the inability of companies to attract workers to fill needed jobs in the supply chain. One of the reasons why a lot of manufacturing has been shifting to China for the last three decades and also contributed to product shortages and supply chain issues. Although some people and politicians are complaining about trade deficits and that outsourcing is stealing jobs from the local workforce, they took our jobs! Yeah, they're down! They took our jobs! They took your jobs! They took your jobs! The truth is, we don't have any people willing to work those jobs anymore. Before we talk about how and why labor shortages have contributed to the supply chain crisis, let's see why jobs have been outsourced overseas in the first place. According to economists, having trade deficits isn't necessarily a bad thing. Quite the contrary, it's an indicator of a strong economy, which kind of makes sense when you consider that it's cheaper for developed countries to rely on imports rather than manufacture locally. Even though in recent years China has grown to be the world's second economy, its GDP per capita is still lower than a lot of European countries with a lower GDP, like Greece or Romania. The GDP per capita is often used as an indicator of a country's standard of living, which means a lower per capita GDP also translates to cheaper labor costs. The reason we've been mentioning this is that if you look close enough to what's happening to the manufacturing industry in recent decades, you can start to notice some patterns. For example, in the United States, manufacturing jobs have helped build up the middle class after World War II. However, since 1979, manufacturing employment in the U.S. has been declining, especially in industries that have had to compete with rivaling Japanese brands. Find a better built truck than Toyota. Buy it. You asked for it, you got it. Then, in the late 80s, manufacturing jobs slowly started moving to China, and then the move really started taking speed in the 1990s. During about the same time, Japanese corporations have also started moving manufacturing to China themselves in order to benefit from cheaper labor costs. Meanwhile, China has managed to become the world factory. But guess what? Nowadays, China's manufacturing industry is also facing competition from other newer developing countries. The manufacturing industry has brought China a rapid economic rise as no other country experienced before. Many were lifted out of poverty, and all this growth gave birth to a middle class. So this proves the point we made earlier. A higher standard of living means that a country can't be competitive cost-wise when it comes to manufacturing labor-intensive products. Although a lot of progress has been made in automation, there still are jobs that can't be done by robots. So as we've seen, companies outsource these jobs where labor is cheaper. This may seem unethical or selfish, but on the other hand, that's just economics. And now for your first economics lesson. So long, suckers! So, since China is no longer the world's number one supplier of cheap labor, then who will be the world's next factory? Since the end of the 2000s, a lot of manufacturing has also started shifting to Vietnam. Since labor costs in China were on the rise, different corporations from either the US, Japan, Korea, and even China have started slowly and carefully moving production to Vietnam. But this move was further accelerated after the election of President Trump and especially in 2018 after the beginning of the U.S.-China trade war. But the trade war only accelerated the move of manufacturing from China. It was slowly happening anyway, because as we made our point earlier, as a country's economy grows, so do its labor costs. And the Chinese know this already. This is why they're making all sorts of investments in Africa. As we've mentioned in a previous video, China is also dealing with labor shortages of its own, or also, better said, the inability to attract the younger generation to manufacturing jobs. And now, since Vietnam has also started developing, which means labor costs are starting to rise there also, many companies have hopped over to Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, or who knows where they'll be looking for cheap labor next. So politicians complain that jobs have been moved overseas and we should fight to bring those jobs back. That's just to crank people up, have something to point the finger at, 
and divert attention from what's really going on. The reality is that those jobs have moved overseas and there's no reason to try to get them back because the economy has developed and the local labor market isn't competitive anymore. The same reason manufacturing jobs have moved overseas are the same reasons immigrants are coming to Western countries to do jobs that the locals aren't interested in or wouldn't do for the same pay that immigrants are willing to take. Getting skilled people from the UK, we don't find that difficult. What we find very difficult is the jobs which the British do not want to do. Nobody wants to work in the cold British weather. Nobody wants to work in freezing conditions, work outdoors. So unfortunately, that's the difficulty that we've had. So the reason we've been talking about these trends is that, to put it frankly, the richer a country gets, the lazier its labor force gets. That could seem an exaggerated and harsh way to put it, but essentially, this is what's going on. This was never more obvious than during the supply chain crisis that started in 2021. Labor shortages in Western countries are a big reason that contributed to the product shortages, container backlog, and all major issues in the supply chain. They aren't the main reason, but they are definitely a major factor. Now, we know that some people might argue that there are no labor shortages, everything is a cover-up, and the whole crisis was engineered and so on. Sure, anyone can believe what they want, and if you want to rant in the comments, let it rip. But let's try to look at all the facts logically before we draw a conclusion. When attributing labor shortages as a factor to the supply chain disruptions, we're not only talking about a shortage of crane operators and ports or truck drivers. There's also forklift drivers, warehouse workers, people loading and unloading the containers, and a whole lot of other people that have one role or another in the supply chain. So why is it we can't find people to fill these jobs anymore? As we said earlier, since Western countries have a higher standard of living, the working age population isn't interested in these jobs. You could get by fairly easily by choosing from the many other available jobs that don't require as much work. Also, the mentality of the young people these days is different from previous generations. Everyone is aiming towards white-collar jobs, and blue-collar jobs are more or less stigmatized. Looks like my folks won't have enough money to put me through college. Well, the world needs ditch diggers, too. Millennials have been brought up to aspire towards office jobs, like managers, lawyers, accountants, sales, and such like those. Since blue-collar jobs are usually known to be less paid, there's a lack of people willing to fill these jobs. Unlike previous generations, like the baby boomers, for whom, because of a different economic environment back then, it would have been inconceivable for one of them to become an entrepreneur and start a business, millennials seem to be opening as many startups as there are stars in the sky. Nowadays, with so many examples of entrepreneurs that started a business from their garage and became Fortune 500 companies, with so many motivational speakers and online courses selling you the secret to setting up a successful online business, not by investing in any kind of infrastructure, but by using print-on-demand and drop-shipping services, it kind of makes sense why nobody has the desire to work a normal job anymore. Plus, there are also newer ways to make a living that many aspire towards, like being a social media influencer, a YouTube creator, or an internet celebrity. These are freelance jobs that we weren't even envisioning at the beginning of this millennium. All of these social factors also explain why we've been seeing the Great Resignation Phenomenon, or Big Quit, that started at the beginning of 2021, where employees are voluntarily resigning in huge numbers. Some are arguing that government COVID relief programs are also a reason why people could afford quitting their jobs and aren't going to help fill in much-needed jobs and supply chains. But as we said, there are also people with a different opinion that say there are no labor shortages. It's just that companies are greedy and don't want to pay employees enough. Wage stagnation and rising living costs was an important reason that contributed to the Great Resignation. That's a valid point employees have. But let's also look at it from an employer's perspective. In a normal economy, competition, supply, and demand are all factors that influence the market price for certain products or services. Consumers want to get the best value for their money, so companies have to stay within standard market price ranges, otherwise they go out of business. So we're in a vicious circle here, because although market prices have been rising, so do the costs of companies, but profits have been stagnant. This is maybe with the exception of giant multinationals or monopolies that can always tap into other cheaper labor markets. But for your average employer, like for example a restaurant or a service provider, Costs are rising, but profits are stagnant. And on the other side, for your average employee, despite rising living costs, wages are stagnating. 
These aren't new problems at all, and a lot of people are saying that the 2008 financial crisis never really ended. So it may be possible that these issues have been sitting under the carpet all along and are more obvious now. So whether you want to call it labor shortages or call it a lack of properly paid jobs, you have to agree that this sounds a lot like inflation. According to NASDAQ, as of March 2021, the U.S. government injected up to $5.2 trillion in the economy for COVID relief costs. That's more than the U.S. spent in its 13 most expensive wars combined. As any economist would tell you, printing too much money makes money lose its value, causing inflation, which causes prices to rise. So with all this new money created out of nowhere, and also global inflation on the rise, it's going to be interesting to see what 2022 has in store. But back to the current issues in supply chains. Congested ports and the chaos in international logistics also had a major part to play in the supply chain crisis. The unprecedented reduction in international trade in the first few months of the pandemic disrupted the normal flow of goods on shipping lines. The pandemic also diminished the available workforce both within the terminals and in support of functions such as truck drivers. This led to containers not being available at the right places at the right time, causing container shortages, vessel delays, and limitations to the volumes that could be loaded on ships. To get into more detail, let's see the reasons that caused all these container shortages. When importing goods from one country to another, a container would usually be dispatched by truck to the location where the goods are to be loaded. After the container is loaded with the goods, it would be trucked to the port of export, loaded on a cargo ship, and then sailed to the port of destination. After being unloaded off the vessel, the container would be trucked to its final destination, unloaded, and then head to another location where it is needed, loaded up with products again, and the cycle repeats itself. The change in trade patterns and the lack of truck drivers has caused many containers to be stuck inland in many locations, unable to reach the locations where they are needed. Also due to pandemic restrictions, many ports are lacking the available workforce to be able to unload ships at a normal pace. So many ships are stuck off the coast waiting to dock and unload cargo. 70 cargo ships are waiting to get into the L.A. and Long Beach ports and the shipments are carrying everything from furniture and electronics to holiday toys. Well, officials say the delay is partly because there is a shortage of trucks and drivers to pick up the goods. The Port of L.A. director says shipping traffic is also up 50 percent from pre-pandemic levels. This is further contributing to the container shortage and increasing the costs of cargo carriers that in turn charge higher rates to recover their losses. But still, what is the full reason for the record high shipping rates carriers charge these days? Shipping prices to many destinations are currently at about four or five times what they usually were during high seasons in previous years. This is especially valid for shipments from Asia to Europe or the American continent, which are some of the busiest shipping lines in the world. The unpredictable development of the pandemic led to congested ports, ships waiting to dock, delays in schedules, which increased cost burdens for carriers. As in any other industry, high demand and low supply leads to price hikes. Every year there are high and low seasons in the global shipping industry. Prices usually drop during low season and rise toward the end of the year when it's high season and most companies are rushing to get their products shipped before Christmas or Chinese New Year. But 2021 was a year of shortages. Major disruptions to supply chains have caused companies to run out of essential materials or products to run their businesses. So as many are trying to get back to normal, the demand for shipping containers is also high. Tight shipping capacity is also another reason that could be attributed to the record shipping rates. Let's not forget that at the start of the pandemic, a lot of carriers have sent some of their ships to scrapyards. In many cases, these ships were retired sooner than originally intended, so their companies could cope with financial burdens caused by the pandemic. Coupled with the low availability of containers, this is also another reason that caused shipping prices to rise. At least, this is the official narrative. Some people are saying cargo carriers are charging these ridiculous rates just because they can. Others are also suspecting that the reasons might be political. Since the U.S. and other countries are in an ongoing trade war with China and vice versa, these price increases might actually be incentivized by some governments to get companies to rethink their supply chains. But we believe this is highly unlikely and limited capacity and high demand are the most logical causes for the shipping crisis. So you might say, okay, this explains the high rates for ocean freight, but what explains the price increases for air cargo? If you've been working in the import-export business for a while, we're sure you know that air cargo rates are also at their highest levels. 
Again, this is valid, especially for shipments from Asia, where most consumer goods or electronics are manufactured. First of all, uncertain delivery times and high rates for sea shipments has put pressure on shippers to opt for air transport. Second of all, travel restrictions and reduced passenger flights are causing a capacity shortage. You might think, what do passenger flights have to do with cargo? Well, don't think that when you get on a flight, only your luggage goes in the cargo hold. Airlines also use the remaining space for transporting cargo. Although there are regular cargo flights, the demand is so high that prices have nowhere to go but up. But even so, pandemic prevention measures and sudden outbursts have also caused disruptions to flight schedules and cargo delays. For example, in August 2021, new cases of the virus have diverted flights to Shanghai Airport in China. The China-Europe Rail Link has been another alternative for cargo from China bound for the European Union. China Railway Express, a key rail project under China's Belt and Road Initiative, has seen a record rise in demand amid challenged air and ocean freight markets. But if you are an importer from Europe in need of products or materials from China and think that this might be the solution to your problem, don't be too happy yet. Rail transport is also subject to delays and price rises, because to put it frankly, the system is overloaded. China to Europe rail traffic has exceeded the volume planned in 2018, stressing the limited system. As of September 2021, delays in border crossings and congested European railways have caused rail operators to limit or cut services to Europe. Meanwhile, expansion projects at key European rail gateways are also having an impact on available capacity. On top of the rail hub delays, available containers are also in extreme short supply in China. If you found this content useful so far, we would appreciate it if you'd click the like button to help us create more videos like this. And if you haven't yet, please subscribe to the Texan Industries channel to be up to date with all of the content we post. So we've been talking about all the difficulties the global trade and logistics system is facing. But what does the future look like? What makes many think that things won't return to normal anytime soon? As we said throughout the video, as opposed to the start of the pandemic, fierce competition for container capacity is now the new normal, so freight rates aren't expected to go down anytime soon. Problems that have built up from the beginning of the pandemic have caused trade imbalances that are far from resolved. With countries locking down and opening up at different times, sudden outbursts of new cases happening occasionally, there's no certainty when things will start coming back to normal or what the new normal will be. As economies are starting to recover, demand will also keep rising as inventories are rebuilt across supply chains. For most consumer products, there are few alternatives to ocean freight. For higher-value products, alternative modes of transportation would be an option, like air freight or the Silk Road train link for the EU. But as we said earlier, these methods are also over capacity, and either way, importers are seeing significant increases to their sourcing costs. This means that consumers may start to feel the impacts through price increases, which may also affect the economy overall. An unbalanced recovery throughout 2021, port congestion, and unavailable workforce will keep creating delays. However, container liners have enjoyed outstanding financial results since the pandemic, and new orders for container ships has reached a record of 229 vessels, with a capacity of 2.2 million containers measured in 20-foot equivalent units. This new capacity won't be ready for use until 2023, and will represent a 6% increase after years of low deliveries. This will put downward pressure on shipping costs, but many analysts say it's highly unlikely for shipping rates to return to their pre-pandemic levels. And in our own opinion, we do believe this might be the case, unless demand drops to levels lower than they've ever been in 20 years. To counter the effects of the global shipping crisis, retailers came up with creative ways to avoid delays. So stay tuned. We'll be talking about why big retailers like Walmart, Target, Home Depot, Costco, and Dollar Tree are throwing themselves into long-term agreements to sail their own vessels. Walmart has taken shipping matters into its own hands, chartering a number of ships from August 2021 onwards. And the list doesn't stop there. For example, Coca-Cola has also taken a creative approach to ensure timely delivery of supplies around the world to its bottling plants. The beverage giant is going to great lengths by using bulk shipping vessels to ship its materials. Bulk shipping vessels are, exactly like the name says, used to transport raw materials in bulk, like grains or coal. Coca-Cola turned to the alternative of using bulk carriers over the traditional containerized shipping approach in order to maintain its operations. And it's not only U.S. companies that have turned to drastic measures in order to keep up to supply demand. Swedish retail giant IKEA is also chartering its own container ships 
and has also bought shipping containers to ensure goods keep moving on time. The move was triggered by delays to the 100 containers IKEA had on the Ever Given, which made global headlines when it was grounded in the Suez Canal in March. So 2021 has been a rough year when it comes to the normal flow of goods in global markets. Whether you work in international trade or not, if you read the news once in a while, you probably know that there is a lot of chaos within supply chains. One way or another, you are probably affected by it, either by having to pay more for products or services, not finding certain products in stock, or by the fuel and power shortages happening in many countries. The shipping crisis is only one of the many obstacles that are currently impacting international trade. Besides the pandemic, there are several reasons that got the shipping industry to this point. We've previously made a video explaining some of the causes. If you haven't watched it yet, we'll leave a link in the description down below. There's an old saying that goes, if you want something done right, you better do it yourself. This is what some of the biggest retailers in the U.S. are doing right now taking matters into their own hands to ensure business as usual for the upcoming holidays in 2021. The container backlog and the recent trend among retailers to look for alternative solutions was dubbed as container get in by Reuters, and then other media outlets picked up the term soon after. So what started container get in? Several reports say that the equivalent of more than half a million 20-foot shipping containers, or TEUs as they're called in the industry, are stuck off the coast of Southern California, sitting on ships waiting to dock. This is caused by ports operating at lower capacities due to a lack of workers and truck drivers, as well as previous disruptions in supply chains due to the pandemic. In order to overcome port congestion issues and to guarantee they can stock their shelves in time for the holidays this year, big retailers have decided to charter their own cargo ships and rent containers to import goods. This will secure much-needed shipping capacity, especially for season-specific products, like, for example, Christmas sweaters or toys, and Christmas decorations, which can't be sold after the holidays. You might be thinking, how would chartering their own ships help retailers if the ports are congested? First of all, the company leasing a vessel can set the vessel's voyage, meaning they can sail directly to any port they want, as opposed to container liners that follow a specific shipping route. Second of all, the ships that Walmart or other retailers are leasing are smaller cargo ships. This allows them to bypass congested ports and unload cargo faster than by shipping through regular shipping lines. In fact, many of the ships chartered by retailers have actually been repurposed for carrying containers. As Reuters reported in October, Walmart has chartered a grain cargo ship, stuffed it full of toys and consumer goods, and sent it away from the L.A. port to a nearby cargo dock. Or, as we mentioned earlier, Coca-Cola took a more creative approach by shipping supplies in bulk. To understand why smaller vessels can bypass port congestion and also one of the causes of the container backlog, we must first take a quick look at the history of shipping containers. Shipping containers are a relatively new thing, and they revolutionized the shipping of break bulk cargo like manufactured goods. Before the advent of containerization in the 1950s, Break bulk items were loaded, lashed, unlashed, and unloaded from the ship one piece at a time. In the shipping industry, container capacity is abbreviated as TEU, which means a 20-foot equivalent unit. One TEU equals a 20-foot container. The earliest container ships could carry from 500 to 800 TEUs. But in order to maximize their profits, shipping companies prefer bigger ships that can carry a higher capacity per voyage. So for the last 20 years, we've been seeing ship capacities rise, from 6,000 to 8,000 TEUs in the early 2000s, to 21,000 to 25,000 TEUs in 2019. The problem is that as ships got bigger, not all ports and container terminals caught up. So this means that big container ships like the ones operated by Maersk or other carriers can only dock at bigger ports that can accommodate them. Of course, due to their size and the shortage of workers, it takes longer to unload these vessels, causing delays and port congestion. So by leasing out smaller vessels, the big retail chains aren't tied to docking at the bigger ports that are blocked and can unload their cargo at other smaller ports or cargo docks that aren't as congested. But these ships are only used to move part of the total imports. The rest still comes on regular container liners. So what does the big chains taking matters into their own hands mean, and what implications does it have? Although these measures will help retailers stock up in time for the holidays, this doesn't help them save on costs. 
Quite the opposite, this will cost more than shipping through regular container liners, even considering that shipping rates are currently higher than they've ever been. For consumers, this will more than likely translate into higher prices. Another sad reality is that while big chains have the financial possibilities and resources to overcome shortages in supply chains, in the long term we might see smaller mom-and-pop businesses and startups be affected by the shipping crisis. This in turn might further delay post-pandemic economic recovery. Many reports say that the chartering contracts retailers have signed into aren't short-term deals, which would lead one to think that the shipping crisis won't be over anytime soon. We would like to hear your opinion about the global shipping crisis, so please let us know in the comments below. If you found this content useful, please give the video a like, and if you haven't yet, please subscribe to be up to date with all the content we make. And as always, thank you for watching.